additive manufacturing, the strategic solution for supply chain disruption and efficiency. We'll start in a while. With us, we have our speaker, Mr. Muhammad Farid bin Muhammad, who is the chief technical expert from Cuba Lab. SHRDC is proud to work with Cuba Lab to bring you this very useful and insightful webinar. Before we go to the um, webinar, let us have some uh, housekeeping rules. All participants' video and audio capability will be disabled during this webinar. The race and action is regrettably not attended due to the time limitation. Kindly use the chat box if you wish to have any general uh, inquiries for today's session or for any questions. We are recommending you to select the side-by-side -side or speaker view uh, for optimal view of this webinar. Kindly also post your questions in the chat box, which will be addressed at the end of the presentation. This webinar is going to be very interactive with a lot of videos. And uh, Mohamed Farid has more than 22 years experience in um, additive manufacturing. Before we further uh, introduce Mohamed uh, Farid into the topic, uh, he will be posting some questions on the slides, which we will, um, we will need you to answer in the chat box. Thank you very much. Mohamed Farid, you can now take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munis. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. And a very good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, SHRDC, for actually inviting us, uh, Cuba Lab, to do a pro uh, presentation on additive manufacturing. Um, before I actually go into the presentation, I think I should share my slide. Hang on. Um, I hope everyone can see the same slide. Or maybe, hang on. Hang on. I think I forgot to switch on the video. Are you all able to see the slides of Mr. Fari? Okay, I already shared the sound. So, yes, can everyone see the slide? Yes, everyone can. I hope everyone can see the slide. Some says yes. Pritika, thank you, Pritika, for saying yes. Thank you, Mr. Narain, for saying yes. And welcome for this webinar. Okay. I'm going to stop my video because I'm, I might be afraid that I have uh, lagging during the video. So I'm going to switch off my camera and I'm going to start doing the presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, again, uh, the topic for today is um, the strategic solution for supply chain disruption and efficiency. First of all, I would like to actually have like a um, short video introduction of Cuba Lab. Okay. And I guess Ms. Muniz has already actually uh, introduced myself. Uh, my name is Mohamed Farid, and I have actually a professional working experience for 22 years in the area of sound and vibration, simulation, testing, and also additive manufacturing. Uh, I have a train the trainer certificate of number 7135 and I used to work for an international company called LMS International. Um, I've actually become a project manager for Honda Service Center as well. But now presently, I am actually in charge of uh, all the business development for ORS and Cuba Lab is actually our sister company and we actually concentrate on additive manufacturing and also augmented reality. Okay, this is the topic again, and the agenda for it is uh, here. Uh, as you can actually see, uh, it's actually uh, an essential skill for additive manufacturing. And then I have like a five minute for industry 4.0, additive manufacturing, history of additive manufacturing, 3D printing and also rapid prototyping, types of user of 3D printing, additive manufacturing technology, uh, industry application for 3D printer, and also services in Mari for additive manufacturing. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the next slide now. Okay, 
before everyone would like to actually go into this uh, additive manufacturing or what we call 3D printing, there are six essential skills for additive manufacturing. Uh, number one is actually reverse engineering. Uh, number two would be the CAD modeling. Number three would be the conceptualization and design optimization. And then you have the rapid prototyping, uh, post-processing and finishing. And last but not least will be the critical thinking and also soft skills. Okay. Let's go to the history of Industry 4.0. I actually have a slide, but I have a very nice video of it. So I'm just going to run through this slide here, uh, showing you why is it called Industry 4.0? So you can actually see that's Industrial Revolution, which is the mechanization. The second Industrial Revolution will be the electrification. And the third Industrial Revolution is digitalization. And the fourth uh, Industrial Revolution will be the uh, digital transformation. Okay, I'm gonna show you, share you this video here, uh, the history of Industrial Revolution. So as you can actually see in the short video, you see the 3D printing is uh, available there in, in the industry 4.0. Uh, this slide here is just to explain to you about the, the naming of uh, industry 4.0 for each uh, different country. You can actually see uh, industry 4.0 is actually coming from Germany. And there's a lot of uh, naming for different type of uh, country. So you can actually see in US, it's called Manufacturing Renaissance. Uh, you see in France, it's called uh, Industry of the Future. So it's actually the same thing. Okay, um, and here's actually a short video on Industry 4.0. Uh, do enjoy. Oops, sorry. What is Industry 4.0 and what does it mean for you? Technology is driving change across all areas of society. Not only do we increasingly use it and even rely on it in our personal lives, we also find our workplaces digitally evolving with more and more processes now being undertaken using technology. This change is known as the Fourth Industrial Revolution or Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 will see many tasks that were once performed by us now being automated. With the collection and analysis of real-time data, artificial intelligence and the ability for all components of a production line to talk to each other, production can be really efficient and personalized according to customer needs. But what does this mean for us? With increased automation, our time will be freed up for concentrating on more complex tasks. We will need a workforce who are capable of building, programming and developing these technologies, but also making sure we are applying them to our lives in an ethical way. There are core skills that we can offer that technology cannot replace. The human touch is going to be incredibly important, ensuring effective communication, problem solving and supporting change management in this digital environment. 
there will also be a greater need for joint working across disciplines, creating new innovations. The future job market will be looking for graduates with an open mind to explore the unknown future possibilities. We will all need to develop our skills in order to embrace, adapt to this ever-changing environment. What will you do to make sure you are ready and have the right skills to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution? Okay, the, that video is actually just um, explanation of Industry 4.0 and what is the impact for us in the future. And I guess uh, from the video you see, we know that uh, 3D printing is one of the key disruptive technology that is going to happen in the future soon. So everyone should actually go into this area because um, this will be the new um, future technology. Okay, this slide here is just explaining uh, the naming again. Um, uh, in the previous two slides, it's also saying that, but there's also a different naming as well. You have the industry 4.0, the factory of the future, digital manufacturing, smart manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, cyber physical manufacturing, and also the internet of things is all the same. It's actually industry 4.0. All right, and this slide here is actually a source from uh, Ministry of Inter International Trade and Industry. Uh, so you can actually see that this was the earlier version of um, adaptation for Industry 4.0. So we have the nine pillars there and uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing is already available. And we now adapt these 11 pillars. So we have ad actually added the um, artificial intelligence and as well as uh, advanced manufacturing into the pillar. Okay, so now we are actually going to be talking about additive manufacturing or what we say a call 3D printing. So if you can actually see in this slide here, it says that additive manufacturing is an industrial production name for 3D printing. And this is due to the fact that almost all typical large machining processes involve with material removal, except for 3D printing. So that, that's why it's called additive uh, manufacturing. Okay. And uh, it's built from the uh, 3D object that we have actually designed in CAD or CID, and it's actually added layer by layer. Um, a very simple explanation. So this is a 2D shape. So you have Microsoft Office and then you actually go to uh, your printer and actually print. So this is 2D and this will be in 3D. So you design that um, object there and from there you actually can print it out. Okay. And the history of uh, additive manufacturing. So you can actually see um, it was probably 30 years ago that people are actually venturing into this area. So the first patent by Japanese Dr. Kodama uh, that was in 1980. And then um, you can actually see in 84, um, someone actually took up in French, uh, French engineer took up stereolithography. And then you have Charles Hall in 1986. And then in 1988, they, he actually uh, created the first SLA machine, uh, stereolithography machine. And then in 1988 as well, you have the first SLS machine. Okay, this is actually the first 3D printer available in the market, uh, production by 3D printer. So uh, he founded 3D System Corporation in 1988 and released this SLA one. Okay, this is the, the history. And then you see in 1990, we have the EOS stereo system, and then you have the FDM, which is very, very now commonly used, filament type, uh, fused deposition material, okay? And then in 1993, you have the SolidScape was founded, 1995, the Z Corporation obtained an exclusive license from the MIT. And then in 1999, they actually engineered organ bring new advances to medicine. So it's actually going into medicine in 1999. And in 2000, they actually printed the first kidney. So that was way back 20 years ago. 
they already started venturing into um, human. Then in 2000, they um, created SLM. This is actually a metal 3D printer. Uh, and then you have the Z Corporation for colored 3D printer. And in 2006, they actually have an open source project, so called Repra. And then in 2008, they actually printed a the first prosthetic leg. So this is actually the picture of that prosthetic prosthetic leg. Okay, and in 2010, that was what 11 years ago, uh, they printed the the first um, car. It's called Erby. And then in 2011, they ventured into food. And uh, 2013, Obama mentioned about 3D printing. 2017, um, printing bone. And in 2018, we have the first uh, family who moves into the 3D printed house. So you can actually see the area that 3D printing is actually moving. Uh, venturing into cars, into food, yeah, into bone, uh, human, uh, into house construction. Okay, and this is the uh, picture of the Irby, and I do have a very nice video of this Irby here. I'm gonna just share the video. What you're looking at here is, is uh, we call it now Irby One because there's, there's, we hope there's an Irby Two, and um, but this is the first car we built and the only one we built, and uh, it's a three wheeler. It has uh, rear wheel steering. Uh, it has electric motors that power the front wheels. It has a gas engine in there uh, that we hope to run on biofuel ethanol uh, that that can power the right front wheel on on highway cruising. So it's electric under 40 mile an hour. It's a uh, 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 just on the gas engine or on the internal combustion engine at 70 mile an hour. And so uh, what you see, everything in orange was 3D printed by Stratasys uh, in Minneapolis by Red Eye On, Red Eye on Demand. And uh, even the windows were vacuum formed over patterns that were 3D printed. And um, yeah, so this is this is the, the, the car that we entered in XPRIZE and then we kind of finished it. We, we have a documentary that describes this car and uh, we started a second car um, about February. We announced it uh, uh, with Stratasys in Minneapolis that we partnered with Stratasys and uh, that got quite a bit of attention and we were we called it Irby 2 and uh, and Irby 2 we hope to build and in about two years from now drive it from New York to San Francisco uh, with two people and a dog and our goal is uh, 10 US gallons and uh, we hope we can achieve that goal because the car seems to be getting better and better it seems to be <laughs> getting more fuel efficient uh, the more people contact us and we get better electric motors better batteries uh, and and we hope to even improve the aerodynamics on the second one but as a designer it took me a, a long time to kind of get it but uh, but when I got it I think what what really made me flip uh, and 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 make the leap was this this idea that plants and animals grow up very close to how 3d printers make things and if they're sustainable then maybe we should follow this direction uh, if we want to be sustainable as well I think the tr traditional car companies believe you can keep modifying the, the gas car into a sustainable car and uh, and I certainly don't believe that that can happen I think it has to start from the ground up Okay, very uh, nice video on the first 3D printed car. And I do have a slide here uh, showing Charles Hall. So he was the first guy who actually invented the SLA-1, so the first 3D printer. And actually he won the uh, European Patent Office Prize in 2014 for the award of European inventor for the non-European countries. And here is actually a picture of the 3D printed house. So you can actually see it's actually 1,022 square feet and uh, it says a perfectly habitable and took two days to print. Okay, so I guess, uh, yeah, I have a slide here uh, about 3D printing, explain. So this will be the 3D printing in, um, for fused deposition materials, so the filament type. 
dengan So 3D printing is taking over the world. But uh, how does it actually work? Well, it's quite similar to a normal printer, but then a little different. First, you don't put in an ink cartridge, but instead connect a spool of special printing material like plastic, rubber, or even metal. And you don't print boring text documents, but real-life models of what you've just made on your computer screen. Simply awesome. Right now, you can buy a 3D printer yourself and make complex 3D models with modeling software. But if you're not really a wizard with all that technical stuff, you can buy personalized 3D models online, like fancy toys, bracelets, or phone cases. Then, send it to a 3D print shop nearby, choose a material, and pick up your own unique item. Sweet. In the medical world, they're developing 3D printers with special biological material. They're working on printing heart valves, ears, bones, skin, and even printed a small human kidney that can live for three months. It's just amazing. And hold on to your seats, they're developing a 3D printer that can print in space and are planning to print a moon base. A moon base! But, um, still, the coolest thing you can print with a 3D printer is another 3D printer! Booyah! Okay, um, very short explanation about 3D printing. Um, I, as actually explained to, uh, from Miss Muniz, I do have actually a quiz or pop quiz. So I, I hope uh, you guys can actually uh, answer this question that I'm actually asking. I have five questions. So number one would be how many pillars are there in the new adoption of Industry 4.0 for Malaysia? And uh, number two is editing machine one of the pillars in the industry 4.0. Number three is 3D printing and additive manufacturing the same definition. Number four, who is the founder of 3D printing? And number five, when is the first 3D printer built? So I guess um, you can actually answer that in the chat box. And uh, I'm gonna look at the chat box and probably let's see. Thank you, Mr. Rahman for the 11 pillars answer. We'll be expecting some more answers. I'll probably give you another minute or uh, one minute only for to answer this. Um, yeah, how many pillars are there in the new adaption industry? Is adaptive manufacturing one of the pillars? Is 3D and additive additive manufacturing the same definition? Who's the founder? And when was the first 3D printer built? Thank you, Isaac. Thank you very much. Yes, the answer is correct. Wow. You've been following the webinar very closely. I can see that. Thank you for your, your answers. So when will be the first 3D printer built? Anyone else who would like to answer to this question, this pop quiz questions? Mr. Farid, is 1980 the correct answer? Uh, it's 1988, actually. Ah, it's, it's 1988. The first 3D printers was built. Yes. Actually, it's uh, a little bit vague there, um, in a sense that um, it was built in 1986, but the one um, uh, production uh, printer, the SLA-1, that was in 1988. Thank you, Nabiha, for all your answers. And Ms. Salachin answer Kodoma. Is that correct? Kodama. It was earlier, right? Yeah, but uh, I think the founder would yeah, I it could be it could be right, but uh, I think I'll 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 choose Charles Hall for that because he actually uh, invented the three printer in nineteen eighty six. So and he had the nineteen eighty eight uh, the one that was um, production printer. So I'll, I'll, I think I'll choose Charles Hall. Okay. 
I guess uh, thank you very much for all the answer. I'm yeah. going to go That's back right. to the slide now. It's a personal question now. They would like to see your face. So they would like oh, you okay. to on your video as you speak. Well, I, I'm afraid that uh, I might have lagging. So that's the reason why I don't want to start my video. Ah, okay. I, I, it's, it's not that I don't want to put my face. I'm, I'm okay with showing off my face, but uh, I, I'm, I know I'm going to have lagging when I actually showcase the video. It's going to lag. So that's the reason why I hide my face. I, I, I hope that's all right. You. And you can actually show your handsome face to the participants here. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm afraid that uh, I might have lagging. So I still will switch off. Now I'm actually switching on. So I guess I'm going to go on to, to the next slide, but uh, I'm switching off my video. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right. Let's go to the next slide now. Uh, thank you very much for all the answer. All right, here we have the definition because I do have a lot of questions with regards to this, actually. Um, people were asking me what is the difference between rapid prototyping and also 3D printing. So I actually made this slide just to actually uh, explain about the difference. So you can actually see here uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing is actually a manufacturing process which takes a digital 3D model and turns it into a physical object. In this process, a material is fabricated using a print head, nozzle, or other printing technology. And uh, the rapid prototyping, or RP, is an application used in additive manufacturing to create a model faster than the normal process. And rapid prototyping is mainly completed using 3D printing or additive manufacturing technology. But for you to actually understand a little bit more, you can actually see here we have uh, 3D printing versus rapid prototyping. So when you, you do 3D printing and you print something, uh, you can actually straight away use it. Uh, so that's the difference between rapid prototyping because it's only used for prototyping. And then if you look at the second one, um, cheaper in price for the machines and as well as the maintenance cost. And for rapid prototyping, it could double the price. And then uh, number three will be less or minimal training on how to use the system uh, versus require proper training. So that is actually the difference between 3D printing and also uh, rapid prototyping. Okay, um, this slide here, you can actually see, I have uh, an example of um, what I would call fused deposition material, or, or sorry, modeling, fused deposition modeling, or FFF. Uh, it's actually using a filament type. So this will be the component that will be uh, used. So you have the modeling software, and also you have the slicing software, and then you have the hardware to actually do the printing. Okay, that's how it works. Now I'm actually going to the next slide, which is the type of user of 3D printing, okay? In that slide there, um, you can actually see we have um, three types of uh, user. One would be the typical user, which is um, a user that will download the CAD model from the World Wide Web or the internet. And then they actually import that 3D um, into a slicer software and then they slice it and then they actually print it uh, using a 3D printer. And then we have the second user, which is the intermediate user. So the intermediate user, the difference is that he creates the model in CAD or CID software. And then it imports that to a slicer software and then uh, it prints it out. And then the last but not least would be the advanced user whereby they will actually create the model in CAD or CID software. But then the difference between the intermediate and the advanced will be the optimization of the design. So the advanced user will use another software um, to actually do uh, generative design or topology optimization. 
to actually make a better design by reducing the weight and uh, maintaining the strength and also the stress level. And then from there, once it is already optimized, then you actually slice the software uh, using the slicer software. And then you actually can print in a 3D printer. So I have actually one video here. Um, this is a, uh, for advanced user using 3D printing. So do enjoy the video. Spider Bracket project introduced several new technologies that did not previously exist. The hybrid lattice topology optimization based technique developed by Altair, the interface between hybrid lattice model and additive manufacturing machine by Materialize, and the printing process of such artifacts developed by Renishon are instrumental in accomplishing what was considered as impossible in the past. So this part is an architectural bracket. It's got four node points and then a central node at the top. Never before has a structurally informed lattice optimization part been successfully generated and printed. The Spider Bracket project required a collaboration with our partners, blending the most advanced hardware, software, and human skill together to enable broader use of additive manufacturing optimizer structure. When we first heard about this challenging project with Alter and Renishaw, we immediately knew that we would need the full potential of the materialized Magic 3D print suite to ensure the printability of the part. In the first step, Materialized 3 Medic was used to redesign the part. This means that we smoothened out all the irregularities that were visible in the input from Alter. Next, we took a look at all the overhanging regions and support needing surfaces, and wherever possible, we tried to remove or reduce them. Once the redesign was finished, Materialized Magix was used for build preparation. The part gets put on a platform and using the SG Plus module, advanced supports for metal printing can be added. In Materialized 3 Medic, all relevant parameters are defined for the lattice structure, so that the build processor can start slicing without the need to convert to triangle data, which would otherwise result in huge file sizes and excessive calculation times. To produce something of this nature would be completely impossible using any other manufacturing technique. The powder bed melting process that Renishaw uses is ideally suited for this kind of geometry. This part was built using 30 micron layers and it's manufactured out of titanium powder. Just over 24 hours to build is an incredibly complex melting path that the laser takes for each layer. The machine's ideally suited for this kind of part as we're able to dial down some of the power for more of the delicate structures. It's got a very unique recoating mechanism that's extremely forgiving for lightweight lattice structures. It's actually built uh, 15 degree overhangs and typically we only think we can build around 45 degree overhangs with this type of technology. You can see there there's uh, severe overhangs which are built without support. So that's been really positive. I believe that applying this groundbreaking approach will embolden the design community to create a completely new era of applications. Okay, that's a very short video on the advanced uh, user. As you can actually see, it's actually a spider connector for construction. And you can actually see from that video, it's using a um, metal printer and the design that you can actually see was also even lattice structure. So very, very complex. And they actually printed it in 24 hours. All right. Then we have this uh, common CAD and CID software that can be used uh, in 3 printing. So I'm just showing on whatever available CAD software in the market here. Um, I guess you can actually find out more, all right. Um, I'm going to jump this. I'm not going to show this video, um, but uh, and then I'm just going to go into the explanation of a slicer software. So if you are going into the area of 3D printing, the first thing that you also need to understand is a slicing software. So this slicing software does is it slices layer and layer and actually giving a G code to the printer to understand where it has to print. Uh, at which location. So 
um, you need to understand that uh, there is a such a call slicing software called Kura, and this is actually an open uh, software. You can actually download it uh, for free, and then you can actually start slicing. Okay. Uh, this is the example of the slicing. In this video, we'll walk you through the basic steps of preparing your model for 3D printing with Kira. Start by opening a 3D model that's been saved using an STL, 3MF, or OBJ format. Just drag and drop the file into Kira or click on Open File. In Kira, you can preview your model by zooming, panning, and rotating your view. Select your model to adjust it to your liking. With the Rotate tool, you can spin the model along the X, Y, and Z axis. This model needs to be rotated to give it an optimized orientation for 3D printing. The Scale tool allows you to resize your model in multiple ways. You can go straight for the maximum size, or change its size in millimeters as a percentage of the original model, or use your mouse to scale your model up and down. Next up are the Printer and Print settings in the pane to the right. The Ultimaker 2 Plus supports multiple nozzle sizes. For this print, we're using PLA. In the Profile menu, you can choose profiles ranging from Fast Print to Ulti Quality, which lets you choose between more speed and less detail, or more detail and less speed. Normal quality is a good profile for most models. Infill relates to the internal structure of your print. Using the light infill is plenty for most models. If you want to go for even more strength, choose the dense infill or completely solid option. The brim option prints a single layer flat area around your object to help with build plate adhesion. Using the layer view, you can see the brim around your model. If your print has large overhangs, you'll need to generate support structure. This will prevent the model from sagging or printing in midair. This model can be printed without support structure, so we'll leave it off. If you'd like to create your own profiles, just use the advanced mode to make and save personal profiles. There are over 200 customizable settings to help you achieve the best results for your models. When done, select Save to Removable Drive, which will save your file to the SD card ready for your Ultimaker. That's it! You're now ready to start 3D printing. These are the basic steps to prepare your model with Kira. Okay, that's a short video on uh, Slicer software. In this, um, I'm gonna jump this, and I'm just gonna go and showcase the the seven different types of 3D printer. So I guess you have actually seen the SLM just now. Um, we actually have seven different type of printer available in the market. You see the FDM, which is the most common. And then you have the material jetting, the binder jetting, the sheet lamination, uh, the SLA, which was the oldest uh, 3D printing technology. And then you have the SLS, uh, selective laser sintering. This is for powder type, um, nylon or uh, plastic. And then you have this directed energy deposition. This one looks like uh, welding, but uh, yeah, you can actually see it's actually topping it up. So this is the type of uh, FDM mo most commonly used. Um, it has now desktop model, uh, widespread, uh, because um, I guess it's the most common because the pricing of this printer is uh, affordable. So people actually go for this. And then you have uh, material jetting. So the material jetting is actually an industrial type where they use a, a powder type. So the FDM use filament, uh, this one will use powder type. And uh, this one will probably cost 1.6 million to actually purchase for material setting. I'm gonna jump the video because I don't think I have enough time. And then you have the binder jetting. So this one is also a large type of uh, 3D printing. So for visual prototype, for tooling, uh, also used for investment casting and also for larger platforms. And then we have the sheet lamination. So this is um, a technology where I rarely see uh, people use it. Okay. And then you have the SLA. This was the oldest technology. And um, usually it was in the industrial uh, application or industrial machines available. But now we 
um, from form labs they already have the desktop type so you can actually go for this machine and, and you can actually print it out uh, at home okay oh. and then um, this one I've already mentioned the selective laser sintering also the same um, previously was in industry now we already have a desktop version for it okay um, we also have directed energy deposition so this is the one that i mentioned it looks like a welding type of course because it's actually adding material on top uh, i do have a video but i don't think i have enough time to actually showcase um, and uh, I think I'm going to jump the pop quiz as well, but uh, yeah, this is the, the questionnaire. So how many types of additive manufacturing technology available, which is the most famous uh, AM technology and why, and which AM technology is available for desktop or benchtop version. So this was the question. I guess you can actually just answer that in the chat box while I actually just run through the slide. Okay, um, the one that uh, is important and uh, last but not least, the one that we want to actually showcase is the uh, market landscape or why, why we actually want to go into additive manufacturing. As you can see in this slide here, we know for the past year, um, we have seen an increased uh, exponential growth of additive manufacturing market. Towards the end of 2018, the global market was estimated to have reached 9.3 billion. Okay, a key factor driving this growth is the advancements of new application for 3D printing. As companies continue to find areas where the technology adds value alongside traditional manufacturing method. So it's actually trying to complement whatever they already have or available. Unsurprisingly, the key industry at the forefront of adoption remain the aerospace, the medical, and also the automotive. However, there are also emerging opportunities in sectors like consumer goods, energy, and also construction. So AM is actually considered a disruptive technology, which will affect the current technology. Okay. In the automotive, okay, they are actually using in these four areas here. You can see design and concept of communication. And then you see the prototyping validation, reproduction sampling, and also for tooling, and also for customized parts. Okay. Some example here, automotive samples. Uh, here in Malaysia as well, uh, we have um, Mercedes-Benz in Pekan, actually purchasing a 3D printer. We have also in Toyota, automotive, Toyota, using it as a tooling. So instead of actually uh, fabricating in metal, they are actually already using 3D printer. And then you also have Volkswagen. Uh, this is in Europe. So Volkswagen maximizes production efficiency with 3D printed jigs and also fixtures, resulting in 400,000 euro saving per year. So they actually reduce um, the costing for uh, jigs and fixtures. Also, another example here, um, you can actually see uh, Ford reinvented uh, efficient manufacturing using 3D printing, resulting in $1,000 saving per tool. Uh, I think I'm not going to go into this video here. I'm just going to jump, probably just showcasing this 3D printed motorcycle just to show.
Okay, as you can actually see that video there uh, is actually the first uh, printed motorcycle and the structure you see is actually a generative structure. Um, if you want to know, this would be the user advanced user because it's actually already using simulation in there to actually get the topology optimization and also um, what we call generative design. Okay. Uh, in aerospace, you can actually see um, they use this in the design communication, validation stage, reproduction, production, and also for customization. So here you can actually see these are some of the samples of the 3D printed model. And I do have a very nice video on Airbus. Um, technical expert using 3D printing for uh, their production. From the outside, this building near Hamburg provides little indication that one of the most exciting projects currently underway at Airbus is taking place here. It's 3D printing, otherwise known as additive layer manufacturing. These remarkable printers are able to produce metal printed parts for the whole range of Airbus aircraft that are lighter, stronger and potentially substantially cheaper to make than at the moment. Peter Sander from the Emerging Technologies and Concepts Department is overseeing a part of this amazing innovation transformation and he can barely contain his excitement. Well, I have uh, 32 years experience in Airbus and I did 10 different jobs. Uh, but this one, I tell you, in my point of view, is the most amazing story which comes up. This will change our world. How does it work? 3D printing consists of producing a three-dimensional object from a digital file, like this one of a metal bracket that fits on an aircraft, while a 2D printer, like any standard photocopier, reproduces a text or image on paper by laying down a toner on the surface, 3D printing adds a vital new layer, height. Instead of ink toner, the 3D printers here use powder from different metals, including titanium, steel and plastics. On the brand new A350 XWB are plastic covers that protect electric wires. Several hundred of these parts fit onto the A350 and thanks to 3D printing, it took 70% less time to make them and the manufacturing cost plunges 80%. We're at, I would say, the beginning of the, the start of the revolution for 3D printing in the aircraft industry. We're now being able to discover exactly where we can apply it, how we can apply it, and understanding the scope of the benefit it can bring to the aircraft as a whole. Costs aside, there are huge advantages with 3D printing. There's up to 95% less metal waste, which is great for the environment as all the metal needed to make parts is used, unlike with traditional milling. The turnaround time to make parts can be as little as 24 hours, slashing needs for large stocks, which means far more agile factories and far more elaborate parts can be developed. Well, this is a very uh, uh, interesting part because uh, normally this is a part of a fuel system. It's two pipes in one and it's normally welded out of 10 parts. So in this case, with 3D printing, we have the chance to integrate the bracket of the pipe and two pipes at one and print it in one shot. So in this case, we have weight reduction, but of course, the most interesting thing is that we have a cost reduction down to 30%. Another great advantage is retrofitting. One airline with an A310 in service is already flying with a 3D printed part. It's this plastic safety belt holder. The supplier is no longer in business. The molds were lost and rebuilding them would have cost thousands of dollars and been time consuming. Instead, Airbus designed a new holder and simply 3D printed it. Well, of course, this is a plastic part. It's part of a seat and it's a spare part. We did a project together with our spare part uh, colleagues and uh, this is a 30-year-old design and uh, the supplier is not longer available. The tools have been scrapped and we have a need of something about 100 parts a year. So they have to decide to invest in new tools or to use 3D printing technology as an enabler to do it without any tooling and something like this. So we did a redesign in a week and printing in a week. So the redesign itself cost two hours. We took uh, the uh, manual drawing 
redesigned it and then printed it and put it on the desk one week later to the spare part guys. For airlines, the advantages are substantial. Finding spare parts quickly, just a printer away, and of course, lighter, stronger parts on board means massive weight savings and lower fuel bills. In the long term, 3D printing could reduce weight on each aircraft by more than a ton. For the airlines, the biggest benefit I would say today is the weight we reduce from the aircraft. With reducing the weight, uh, we're not only saving costs on our side, but we're also introducing a way for them to improve their fuel burn, save money on their fuel, improve their revenue, uh, and operate the aircraft uh, more efficiently. The first commercial flights with metal 3D parts are expected by 2016 and mass production by 2018, with 30 tons of metallic parts printed every month. Okay, that is uh, an example video showing uh, Airbus actually adapting already 3D printing in their production and also their spare part. As you can actually see, he's already explaining why they're actually going into that. And yeah, how much they can actually reduce in terms of uh, money and also time, as well as the weight, because uh, for airline it's important that you reduce your weight of your aircraft. Okay, for oil and gas, um, again, um, you see they are actually using in the complex prototyping, um, rugged and also sturdy equipment and also spare part. Again, they're also going for uh, spare parts here because we know for sure uh, in oil and gas as well, the duration to actually order a part will take a long time. So instead of actually going to um, ordering and waiting for that order to come, you can actually do 3D printing. Uh, I do have also a video, but uh, I don't think I have enough time for that. I'm going to jump next uh, for consumer goods. So you can actually see consumer goods is the other area that uh, has been widely used uh, trade printing in this uh, consumer goods. You can actually see it actually enhance product development time. It also have a uh, faster time to market and Last but not least, I guess now uh, in the industry 4.0 is mass customization. Okay, this is some of the picture I have um, where you can actually do printing on uh, your product and you want to customize your uh, um, consumer goods. Okay, another example here we have Heineken. Um, they actually actually ensure production continuity with 3D printing by 80% lead time reduction of parts. So you can actually see it, it, it 3D printers itself, uh, this part here, the pack spinner. So it reduced 80%. And then another consumer good here, uh, L'Oreal, uh, ensures production continuity with 3D printing by 80% leading time also. So you can actually see this rubber gripper needs to be replaced monthly. So what they do is actually they use 3D printing for that. All right. And then I have, uh, I'm going to jump this. Uh, and um, now you can actually see uh, construction as well. Okay. Why pe people are going into construction is because it can save time. It use less material and it uses less manual labor. Okay, some other example here, picture example uh, of that uh, construction. I have a video of the printed house, but I don't think I have enough time. I'm going to jump. And then also medical. I think medical has also been part of the 3D printing uh, community a long time. It's also the same as aerospace and also automotive. Uh, you can actually see the reason why they are actually going into it. So they have these complex operations. Uh, they use it for advanced technology. Uh, they use it also for intricate care. Okay. Uh, they use it for expensive procedures and also long waiting time. And they use it also for customization. So here is some of the picture here. You can actually see. So you see the prosthetic, uh, the jaw, the bone, and the tool that they actually use in medical. 
And then you also have now um, emerging the market of 3D printing would be the electrics and also electronics. So you can actually do it for in-house prototyping. Uh, they use it also because they want faster time to market. They also want design flexibility. They also want customization and also they want to simplify their supply chain, which is very important. Okay, here is an example of um, ABB robot. So ABB print cost effective customized functional prototype resulting in 83% cost reduction. So actually they actually made a prototype before they actually go into uh, the production. Also in electric and electronics, you see Jabil uh, drives digital transformation with rapid adoption of 3D printing. So you have 80% reduction in production time with 3D printing. So this 3D printing, it says here, 3D printing has saved the day on numer numerous accounts, says Wall. There were several times when something broke or malfunctioned on the production line, but we quickly replicate the broken part or implement another tool or fixture using 3D printing. So this one is very, very uh, uh, nice uh, uh, example for 3D printing. And then, we have uh, also noise aware uses 3D printing prototype to save money and also minimize risk. So reducing cost from $800 to less than $10 per product. So they're actually using it for prototyping. Okay. Um, then last but not least, uh, I guess uh, this will be the end of my presentation. Just uh, mentioning about Mari, they also have a 3D printer in their facility in Cyberjaya under Mumtech and they have this SLA printer here. Okay. All right, I think I'm done for the slide. Um, any questions from the floor or from the participant? Thank you very much, Mr. Mamat Farid for the insightful webinar. Now Thank I'm you. opening the floor for more questions and answers. Feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and we will answer it accordingly. Any questions? Any questions from the floor? I'll also be starting a poll that you can actually ask uh, answer our questions. Nope, from Pritika. Any other questions from the floor? I hope this webinar was very useful for you all. We'll also be sending a thank you note later with the audio record, with the video recording of this um, webinar session to you all for your reference. It will also be posted on all our social media and also YouTube channel. Kindly okay. like our Facebook, SHIDC and Cuba Lab for more details on our upcoming webinar series or any other event. Okay, there is a question from Mr. Patrick Wong. Is yeah, the 3D printer available where again? He's asking the 3D printer available where again? 3D printer available where again? Uh, um, what do you mean? Are, are you trying to um, purchase the 3D printer or... Are you asking which industry is using the 3D printer? If you're asking industry using the 3D printer, I think uh, almost the, the list that I've actually shown you, you see automotive, you see aerospace, you see medical, you see uh, electrics and electronics, you see, uh, what was that again? Uh, construction. So it's actually almost everywhere now, people are trying to adopt uh, 3D printing in their industry. Uh, but if you are asking um, where to actually purchase, um, we do provide the, the 3D printers. There is another question from Mr. Patrick Wong again, that okay. if we cannot afford the 3D printer for consumer products, can we use their services? Of course. There's a lot of services out there. Um, one of it is us, but uh, yeah, you can actually find a lot of people who have 3D printer and you can actually... Uh, get the services from them 
So if they are really good, they will might they might have a CAD so software that they can design and then uh, you they can design and print the the product. If not, then you have to uh, give them the product or the design before they can actually do the printing. So Another question from Patrick is that can we have the presenter contact? Yes, we will be yes. sending the presenter's contact since he's so famous today. With a thank you note that we'll be sending later on. Now, there's yeah. another question from Mr. Hafiz. How much roughly is one unit of 3D printing cost? And kindly provide the contact. I believe the contact is from Mr. Mohamed Farid, the speaker's contact. Okay. Uh, and, how much roughly? Yes. Um, if you're talking about a DIY printer, uh, the FDM, I, I would say if you want to go um, starting a or learning 3D printing, I would say you have to go for FDM type. And if you are the kind of person who likes to do a lot of DIY, I would say you go for the DIY type. And DIY type will cost you about 1,000 thousand over like that. And filament, this is talking about uh, FDM type. Filament will cost you probably 50 to 60 ringgit per kilogram of filament. I hope wow. that uh, answered that question. And... Um, I think Catherine Young was asking about furniture industry. Yes, that's correct. I, I actually have a, a presentation on that as well, but I did not put in. Yes, uh, also for furniture, because you want to optimize your design. Let's say you have a design of a chair and you want to know whether you, um, you can adopt that. Uh, yeah, we do have um, in the industry of uh, furniture as well, uh, available for uh, 3D printing. Um, I guess there will be another question from yes, Ahmad from Mr. Ahmad. Shamil. What is the best 3D printing product FEA software? Um, I think if you are talking about finite element analysis, um, you should go for a software that can actually do topology optimization and or what they also call generative design. So those software are available. Uh, in the in the market that you can actually try. I hope that uh, answers. How about comparison of 3D printing and injection molding? Ooh. Uh, that one also depends. I think uh, question from S. Kuma. Okay, injection molding. If you talk about injection molding, you would know that you need to have the tool and die, right? And that tool and die will be the one that will be very, very costly to actually produce. If you are probably just doing one or 10 parts, I guess you should go for 3D printing rather than injection molding. Unless you're going for 1,000 parts, then you can actually do the calculation and see whether it makes sense to, uh, to go on uh, injection molding. I hope that answers. Any more questions? Okay, there is another question on the private chat box to me from Sela okay. Chin. She okay. is asking, how do we copyright our 3D printing design? I don't know. Well, I've never copyright myself. I always share the design that I've already done uh, in GrabCAD or is, even in Thingiverse. So uh, I don't think I have that answer for you, my friend. Uh, I, I don't copyright my design. So... Unless, unless you don't want to share, then then don't share your, your cat file, I, I, I say. Then you know you no one will actually copyright your design. If you share, that's it. No copyright for you. Hope that answers. I hope it answers all your questions. Any more questions from the floor before we start the polling? I believe there's no more question. I would like to start the polling to see the feedback of this webinar. Okay. Thank you. I hope you guys have uh, enjoyed the presentation.
a lot of people says that this, this webinar did meet their expectation about 89 of them. Only 1% say that it's kind of neutral. Okay. And 93, 94% and still counting says it is very insightful. The webinar Thank is you. very insightful and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita, for the for congratulating us on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. We really hope that this webinar was very useful for you all. And we will be sending a thank you note with the recording shortly for you all to have it for your reference. And please don't hesitate to contact SHRDC for more detail on this. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.